Imagine your quarantine without your favorite shows on Netflix or Amazon or Hulu. Imagine if you couldn't watch your favorite movies or documentaries or listen to music or read fiction. Just imagine what life would be like, what time would be like, what you talk about with your friends. Imagine quarantine without art or without artists, without creative people, or more frightening still, imagine normal life without art, artists, or creative people. Art is vital to our modern lives. It's thoroughly integrated into what we do and how we structure our day, not only while we're in quarantine, but always. So unto the long list of people we've learned to be deeply grateful for over the past few weeks, our frontline workers, medical professionals, grocery store workers, delivery drivers, farmers, we're so grateful for them. We must also add artists, the people who keep us stimulated, who entertain us, who make us think and take perspective, who use their minds, who use their craft, who use their creative talents and their bodies for the common good. So today's event is a celebration of art and of the humanities disciplines that engage, study, and produce artistry. Today's event is also a celebration of literature and storytelling and how vital stories are to literally everything we do. Today's event is also a celebration of one of our most cherished local writers, Ana Menendez, and her craft and her stories, which are so important to us in South Florida and at FIU and far beyond. I'm Philip Carter, and I'm the director of FIU's Center for the Humanities in an Urban Environment, housed in the College of Arts, Sciences, and Education, and I'd like to welcome you to our second Zoom event. I'm so grateful that you're able to join us. I'd like to especially welcome students from Miami Coral Park Senior High School. We have high school students on the call today. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. I'm happy that you're here. And I hope that you enjoy the event and the stories, and I hope that you just take some time to think about what you heard today. I'd like to welcome our FIU undergraduates. I'd like to welcome our faculty. I'd like to welcome all the viewers from Casa Cuba and from the Cuban Research Institute. Thank you so much for joining us. I'd like to thank Dean Mike Heithouse of CASE and Senior Associate Dean Heather Russell for, uh, for their commitment to our center uh, and to the humanities at FIU. I'd like to thank uh, the CASE Community Engagement Team for helping support this event, and to my team and CHU for their hard work. Y ya que este evento es oficialmente eh, bilingüe, también quisiera dar la bienvenida a todos vosotros que estáis viendo desde sus casas, desde sus hogares, eh, en Miami, en Latinoamérica, estéis donde estéis. Eh, lo bonito de este tipo de evento es que podemos conectar con vosotros y compartir con vosotros no importa dónde os encontréis en el mundo. Muchas gracias por acompañarnos el día de hoy. So now the best part of uh, my introduction is I get to introduce our speaker. Ana Menendez has published four books of fiction. Adios, Happy Homeland, The Last War, Loving Che, and In Cuba, I Was a German Shepherd, whose title story won a Cushart Prize. She has worked as a journalist in the United States and abroad, Lastly, as a prize-winning columnist for the Miami Herald. As a reporter, she wrote about Cuba, Haiti, Kashmir, Afghanistan, and India. Her work has appeared in publications including Vogue, Bomb Magazine, The New York Times, and Tin House, and has been included in several anthologies, including the Norton Anthology of Latino Literature. She has a BA in English from Florida International University and an MFA from NYU. A former Fulbright scholar in Egypt, she has also lived in India, Turkey, and the Netherlands, where she designed a creative writing minor at Maastricht University. She is now a program director with academic affairs at FIU. So uh, welcome, Anna. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, um, Philip, for that beautiful introduction and that shout out to uh, artists who have indeed uh, kept us uh, warm and uh, in, in, in uh, solidarity during these times. 
It's uh, I'm almost more nervous, I think, in this uh, format than I ever am in person, uh, just not able to see everybody. But I want to welcome everybody who's been able to tune in on this Monday. We're approaching our uh, uh, 40 days of uh, quarantena uh, soon. And it's wonderful to be able to uh, share in this way uh, with all of you. Big, big thanks uh, to Philip Carter and the center and everybody who supports it. Uh, and works uh, with it, Tempest Morgan, who designed this beautiful fly flyer, and um, to, of course, Anna Lushinska, who will um, talk a little bit about the book uh, later. The, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read different sections of it, and I should have started my uh, timer here. Um, this is a book that's uh, been more than a decade in the making. Um, it's taken various forms. I'll talk a little bit about it at the end. Um, when I talk about the fragmentary form in general, that it concerns a, a tenant, a recent arrival from Cuba, who has um, taken his life in an apartment building in South Beach, owned by this unnamed narrator who uh, works for the State Department and has to come back um, to uh, deal with the tragedy and uh, in the process uh, drops in on some of the neighbors to, to talk to them. And so the book uh, is really a fragment of monologues, what, what um, my friend Andrea Herrera would have called uh, uh, testimonial expressions with uh, paintings and with testimonials from the different people. And what she finds, what this unnamed narrator finds is that um, the, everybody has some uh, story of loss and the disconnection uh, between the people is what comes to the, to the forefront, unfortunately, in, in the book. And it consists of a lot of different fragments. Um, there are snippets from the uh, unnamed narrator's past. Um, we learn a little bit of her own loss. And, um, and then there's several motifs, which I'll talk about as I come to them. But I'm going to read, the sections are generally pretty small, but sometimes I'm going to read just an excerpt from the section because I don't want them to go on too long. So I'm going to start with one um, that's called The Uber Driver Tells Me a Story. Uh, so she's, this narrator has come back um, to Miami. The apartment's uh, called the Helena uh, on Miami Beach. And so this is her first encounter back in Miami. The Uber Driver Tells Me a Story. She was chatting. I hadn't even closed the back door before she asked, your first visit? Oh no, I live here. And as I spoke, I realized it wasn't true. I lived in Cairo or Istanbul or wherever the service sent me next, but I did pay my taxes in Miami, so close enough. Before I continue, I have to say a, a warning. Um, th this is a former reporter talking, and so there's a lot of curse words. Um, so for those <laughs> younger viewers, I apologize. Um, so close enough. Well, she said, then you know traffic is shit. I hope you're not in a hurry. She pulled into the outer ring with barely a look. Before we'd even merged onto the 112, I learned her name, Liliana, and that she'd been driving for Uber since she was laid off from the local paper. It was a home to me, that fucking place, she said, a real home, more real than my own home. They finished raising me. There was love, dysfunctional love, but love. It's a shit paper now, she said, changing lanes also without looking. Not because I'm gone, I mean, although yes, that's part of it. 25 years uh, I worked there, busted my ass, have a string of awards. Not that I give a shit about any of that. Not that corporate did either. Those motherfuckers, they flew in on private jets to announce the firings or whatever they called it, buyouts, involuntary separations. You'd think people with, who traffic in language would learn to speak plainly when it most mattered. But no, they're just like everyone else, cloaking their mendacity in euphemism. I didn't know how to respond. That's tough. I said. So I'm going to share, uh, I did a little PowerPoint uh, for this. Uh, I don't usually do PowerPoints with my reading, but I thought um, it would be nice to have something to look at instead of my face. So um, this is uh, the PowerPoint I put together. Uh, one of the things that I've been doing is uh, also doing a lot of drawing in this uh, quarantine. And so each of these um, characters has a face attached to them in some way. And when I put this particular PowerPoint together, I realized it looked a lot like a Zoom meeting, which was unintentional. Um, but I think also a reflection of perhaps the way that um, art 
uh, reflects life and vice versa. So um, this is uh, the Uber driver. So I'll continue um, with her, a little bit of her piece. Um, yeah, but whatever, you know, during the season now, I actually make more money driving drunken Euro trash around this place than I ever did at the paper. Isn't that something? And the great thing about this job, which I'm very, very happy to have, by the way, is that when I'm done, I'm done. Sure, sometimes if I've been driving for 10, 12 hours straight, I close my eyes and see the road moving beneath me. But that's nothing compared to a reporter's nights, when just as you're falling asleep, you leap up, oh, fuck, I spelled someone's name wrong. I mean, who gives a fuck, right? But that's what it's like when you've been working at a place for too long. The culture becomes part of your own psyche. It's pretty freaky, actually. I've never thought about it that way, I said. Yeah, well, when you're driving around all day waiting for pickups, there's a lot to think about. I imagine prostitutes do a lot of thinking, too. Someone should talk to them. Maybe they've already worked out the mysteries of consciousness in the universe. I laughed. I liked her. This woman. I knew lawyers liked her. They always got people to talk to them. So how long have you been driving for Uber? Almost two years now, she said. I do love it. I get to talk a lot now. You don't mind, do you? I spent my career listening to other people's shit. Now people have to listen to me. You're my captive. Ha ha. I'm joking. Please don't freak out or give me a bad rating. I just have to appreciate the irony of this situation. Among the laziest things you can do as a reporter, and this really separates the hacks from the super hacks, is interview a taxi driver in the exotic foreign locale where you've just landed. Everyone's done it at some point, <clears throat> but no one's proud of it. No one would ever admit to having a driver interview somewhere in their dark past. And now here I am, that very driver. She so checked the rearview mirror to make sure I was smiling. We reached I-95 and she hit the brakes hard. I-95 is a vision of hell, she said. Something happens to people here, you know. Something happens to their brains being in this kind of traffic day after day. It's not healthy. You really have to be aware to not let it affect you. You have to be very conscious about what you wish for yourself and other people. The mind is very powerful. Indeed, I said. I was a very good reporter, one of the best, really. I hope you don't think I'm boasting or that I'm still bitter. Well, I'm a little bitter, but I was a good reporter. I don't take credit for it. I hope you don't think I'm crazy for saying this, but I have a kind of intuition about people. We took the south ramp and came to a full stop which meant that Liliana had the luxury of being able to maintain eye contact in the rearview mirror. You, for example, she said, I'd say you're a government type, very controlled, very proper. I'm not psychic. After so many years as a reporter, you've kind of seen all types. People aren't all that unique, you know, not as unique as they think they are. There are just a handful of types in the world, mostly interchangeable. You, lawyer or analyst, something like that. Some regrets probably well, I'll stop because I don't want to make you uncomfortable. I could say that being a reporter made me this kind of observer. But maybe I became a reporter because I am this kind of observer. You see what I mean? There's some weird shit in the world, and it doesn't always make the kind of sense that we think it does. I say this as a journalist. Well, former journalist. You know, the old fact-based professions quickly going out of fashion. Reporters, myself included, don't go in for that woo-woo shit, believe me. And yet, there's like a parallel logic that runs through things, a complicated kind of symphony that most people barely perceive. I believe this. Do you believe this? How about I tell you about this thing that happened when I was a kid? So even though uh, the tenant, whose name uh, was Lennon Garcia, even though he's gone, um, there are many fragments in, in the novel that um, that uh, um, reflect his story, that tell his story. And um, this is one that sort of uh, starts it all uh, when he's still in Havana. It's called Lennon Garcia Dreams of Miami. It was the fastest path to hard currency in the years after the special period. The summer Lennon turned 16. Pepe told him about it. The two of them had met again behind one of the crypts in the Colon Cemetery. Pepe had brought a magazine, as always. When they were done, Pepe smiled. He reached into his front pocket and drew what looked like a baseball made of dollars. Then, stared with a new kind of desire, and Pepe laughed. 
you go down to the Malecon in those shorts you're wearing, and I'll introduce you to some of my friends. It's easy. That first weekend, Lennon made $30, American ones, more money than he had ever held in his hands at once. He told his mother that he'd found a job tending the pool at a nacional. She wouldn't be allowed in anyway, so how would she know? Just a few hours a day after school, he promised. The Italians he'd heard tipped especially well, and the hotel gave its workers the food left over at the end of the day. To Lennon's surprise, his mother began to cry. He patted her back, patting away his own embarrassment. Yeah, yeah, mamita, this is our lucky time. The uh, next excerpt that I'm going to read uh, is called Milagros Alcala explains why she impersonated her brother. And you're not going to find out why in this uh, snippet that I'm, this excerpt that I'm going to read, so I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, but the building is called the Helena and it's, uh, it's been around um, uh, since the Art Deco era. And um, uh, this is uh, Milagros Alcala talking to the narrator. Milagros Alcala had lived in the Helena since 1979, first as a tenant and then, after the building went condo, as one of the first owners. I'd come to know her around 2003 when some bandits spray painted her car, she was still driving then, with ugly scrawls that, with some effort, we were able to decipher, Al Qaeda go home. Though I had spent many days with Milagros after the vandalism, I had soon moved overseas and saw her only occasionally in the years following. So I was surprised when she opened the door to find that she seemed to have aged all at once. I barely recognized the stooped skinny woman leaning over her walker. I must have looked startled because Milagros laughed and chided me. Don't you know that old age is like night in the tropics? It falls suddenly. One moment this red sky is alive with roosting birds and the next you cannot make out your own arms across your chest. I tried to help her into her chair, but she held out her finger. You sit, she commanded. I can manage on my own just fine. She was 89 years old, but her apartment betrayed none of the trappings of her age or class. No crocheted doilies, no photos of grandchildren in silver frames, no curio cabinet filled with a thousand miniature porcelain figurines. Furniture's straight lines signaled the spare, almost austere modernism. When Milagros was satisfied that I wasn't planning to leap to her aid, she lowered herself slowly above her armchair. At the last moment, she let go of the walker and dropped suddenly. Candelaria, she shouted into the kitchen. A café. A few moments later, a middle-aged woman appeared with a silver tray. Candelaria is a spy in my daughter's employ, Milagros. Ay, señora Alcalá, no sea tan mala, the woman said, smiling. The woman set the tray down with its two demi tasse cups and a saucer of sugar. I took my coffee black, but Milagros poured three spoonfuls into her own tiny cup. Ay, señora, si no, Candelaria cried. The sugar was for your guest. You see what I mean, Milagros said, then turned into, turning to Candelaria. Don't tell my daughter, okay? We'll only worry her. Milagros winked at me. At my age, what does it matter? I'd rather have a last sweet sip of coffee than worry about losing my toes. Candelaria shook her head, picked up the tray, and retreated to the kitchen. Not precisely in my daughter's employ, Milagro said when Candelaria had left the room. Medicare pays most of her wages, and my daughter is fine with that, even though she's married to an attack dog and they both worship like peasants at the altar of Fox News. She tackled happily and closed her eyes to sip the last syrupy dregs in her cup. I waited for her to open them before telling her the reason I'd come. Ah, yes, Lenin. He started this whole mess, didn't he? I meant my tenant, Mr. Garcia. Yes, yes, of course. What do you think? I'm senile? I was making a joke, Mija. Lenin Garcia. A suicide, you say. It doesn't surprise me. After baseball, suicide is Cuba's national sport. Men are stupid for tradition. The uh, book has a lot of um, snippets of poetry and philosophy that deal with the uh, concept of home. The one of the original titles of this uh, book was "Homes We Lost," 
and um, I, the present title, Castle of the Stranger, takes, uh, takes after a, a beautiful poem of Campbell McGrath, uh, our FIU beloved FIU colleague, Campbell McGrath, um, who recently published a, a poem in the New Yorker called The Ladder, and this is a line from that poem, and when I read it, I, I just loved it so much. So I'll read the, the excerpt, um, Castle of the Stranger. Campbell McGrath says, Donegal derives from the Irish dun na nagal Dun meaning fort or tower or castle. And Nagal meaning foreigner, outlander, stranger, in memory of the conquerors who occupied it. The castle of the stranger, which is another name for the past. This next section is called um, Miriam Nader Still Talks to Her Dead Son. And it's a, it's a, this one's a straight monologue. Uh -huh. Lenin Garcia, you were the landlady. Please come in. Take a seat there. Be careful. It's softer than it looks. I'll be right back. There, some tea. I hope you're not allergic to walnuts. I made these yesterday. No, it's okay. I'm sorry. I called him Lele. When I first saw him, my heart danced. He was so much like my Daoud. Same tall, slender build. Same face right down to the eyes, the way they turn down at the corners. Forgive me, I grieve again. I saw him just once or twice. Both times he was smiling. This is why I can't understand why he would do this, do this act that is against God. I thought of visiting him. I regret that I didn't. But he was a young man and young men do not like to spend time with old women. No, no, those are just pretty words. I'm old, I have mirrors. I see for myself that my dear one, if you could have seen me at 18, at 18 before the troubles began and life was sweet and every man at the St. George wanted my hand in marriage. Beirut still shimmers like that in my dreams, the harbor that holds the entire sea in its embrace. I talk to Daoud, I tell him to look after Lele. My son, Daoud, he visits me. He sits there in that chair where you're sitting now, and he looks the same as he did that night, the night I saw him off with a kiss to the forehead. He was 15, already so tall that he had to bend down to receive my blessing. And his smile, his smile is still the same smile he wore that 18th day of February in 1981, our season of ruins. After my Dawood was killed, I was left alone in a city at war. I think back now, and it is a dream. How did we survive it? My building was three blocks from the green line. Two of the north windows had blown, and I'd cut up a shower curtain to cover them. They expanded and contracted in the wind like lungs. But you couldn't stay indoors forever. You had to go out for water, for food. I was a woman all alone. My brothers were in Tripoli. I had not heard from them for months. Those of us left in the building, we helped each other, shyly, protecting the little bit that we had. Certain times of the day, the snipers were worse. You didn't go out then. In my neighborhood, this was in the mornings when the children were supposed to be going to school and in the afternoon when they returned. Do you know that human beings can be like this? Normal human beings, the boys that you took care of, the friends of your son, nice boys. Did you know this could happen? That some blood would rise in them and set them on rooftops like dark angels, deciding who would live and who would die? After war, it's so hard to believe, so hard. You went out at dusk, she continued after a moment, thinking that's when their aim wouldn't be so good. And you ran like a rat, hugging the ruins, keeping your back to the crumbling concrete, back and forth across the city like this, like the lowest animal, just to buy a bit of bread, a small bag of garbanzos. And when an old man was shot just behind you, you kept running. You did not turn around. You ran and you didn't stop. You never turned around. Do you understand? Miriam began to cry. And I took her hand 
and held it for a long time. Who of us really knows what happens when we die? My neighbor, Anna Kralova, she says to me, I don't believe in ghosts. Well, why not? What do we know of this world and its 10,000 forms? Why could this boy not be Daoud come back to me? Of course, this is madness. Everyone knows this is madness. And yet, Lele rescued sea turtles with his father, the way Daoud and I saved that nest of sarans fallen to the street on a cold blue spring day before the war, when Daoud was still the little boy who took our hands between his parents, still alive then, father and son, still alive. Miriam turned to me, eyes bright. Birth and death are perched on a precipice, my dear one. The years in between, we cling to love. This uh, next section is called uh, How Lenin Garcia Escaped His First Death. Tuesday morning, another interview, this one at a bank downtown. Running late, Lenin is already sweating beneath his one good suit, the suit that represents a week of his mother's dinners. The Lenin tries to put the figure out of his head. Investment. That's a word he learned in Miami. Investment. The word reminds Lenin of holy robes, the cloth a believer inhabits with hope of rewards in a next life. Halfway to the MacArthur, Lenin realizes he's forgotten his wallet. He hesitates. Maybe he won't need it. But then the idea of flashing lights in the rearview mirror, of having to produce his ID, of where are you from and no proof of his name. The next light, Lenin does a U-turn. He double parks outside his building and rushes up the stairs. His armpits are damp by the time he takes the wheel again, while it's snug in his back pocket. At the MacArthur, the traffic suddenly congeals. Lenin Garcia creeps along, the digital clock in his Honda Civic cruelly eating up the numbers. Sirens. When he finally passes the crash, Lenin doesn't look. He doesn't see the stretchers, the two cars on their collapsed roofs, a third car flattened against the containment wall. He will be very late now. He won't get this job either, but he drives downtown anyway in a rage, and he doesn't notice the birds circling above, holding up the entire sky. One of the motifs running through uh, the book, one of the little snippets is rats. And um, there's a couple little stories about rats. I'll read a, a quick one. Rats. In India, the Karni Mata temple is home to 20,000 rats who are lovingly fed and revered. I never visit, but the rats visit me. At first, they are shy. When they grow bold, challenging me in daylight, I tell Dunduk that she must do something about them. Poor Dunduk, our Buddhist teacher, whom we call Maid. I've tossed her a base conundrum. She solves it by buying humane traps. One evening, she lays them out on the kitchen counter, baited with bits of naan. In the morning, I wake to find Dunduk leaning over the traps. Every one of them holds a nice, plump rat. And through the slats of each trap, Dunduk is pushing fresh leaves of lettuce. Later, she says, she will take the trapped rats across town and release them in the elegant suburb of Greater Kalash. No doubt the gentle maids of Greater Kalash will one day bait their traps and transport the rats across the city back to us. It seems grand, all this wearing of furrows in the earth, that if we're honest, our lives most faithfully follows the path of Dundup's rats, forever being transported from one borrowed home to the next, an endless loop of wandering that to our little rat brains seems almost an act of will. I'll end uh, the reading uh, from the book with uh, a section that comes very close to the end, um, and it's called Lenin Garcia Contemplates What Might Have Been. If he had taken his money to a bank instead, if he had made a different hiding place, if he bought a safe, if he could have done different work, CEO, tax accountant, pediatrician, bank teller, street sweeper, landscaper, if he never left Cuba, if he hadn't accepted Mario's money, if he had never met the client on the Malecon, never met Pepe, never gone to the Colon Cemetery, 
the Havana wouldn't have been flooded by foreign men with appetites if foreign men had not hoarded all the riches, if his father hadn't died of a heart attack when he was five years old, if Lenin's last memory of him was pleasant and not of his father naked, still wet from the shower, son, call your mother, I'm not feeling well. If he had been able to continue his studies, if his mother hadn't gotten ill, if the revolution hadn't triumphed, if the revolution had triumphed differently, if its leaders had been economists, if the world had been kind, if the two great powers had never learned to play chess, if weapons named after hell's furnaces had never been invented, if poverty hadn't been part of the plan, if everyone had been satisfied with what they had, if they had been willing to share, drawn up a different future, decided ahead of time that no one would be hungry. The hurricanes hadn't come. The yellow fever had been vanquished earlier. If revolution had never been necessary, if men had never dreamed of glorious death, if conquerors had stayed home to knit, if the great, great, great grandmother so brilliant had been allowed to finish school, if the great, great, great grandfather had never been kidnapped, if the wealth of nations hadn't rested on the labor of the forgotten, if the seed from which they'd all sprung had grown straight and true, if they had built a house with room enough for everyone, if at the very beginning, all of the paths had been made clear and the first man and the first woman had been allowed to inspect the maps and say this one, this is the correct way. This is the road that will take us to that world where all our children will be happy. And I'll uh, end the reading there. Um, I, I did want to talk a little bit about the fragmentary form and some of the influences on this novel, which is, is still very much in draft form. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping uh, that, that, you know, not assuming that it will ever see the light of day. Um, and I, I want to talk by, uh, start by talking a little bit about uh, uh, John Gardner, uh, his book, The Art of Fiction, which was a, a a very influential book uh, to me as a writer. Um, and I, I think for many writers, uh, especially his much quoted observation that good fiction is a vivid and, and continuous uh, dream. And um, uh, this dictum is repeated so often that I was surprised when I went back to the book while I was preparing um, a version of this talk that I gave at FIU and then I also gave uh, at Colby College in Maine uh, right before the shutdown. Um, and found that Gardner had actually hedged the advice a bit by inserting the word probably um, and a concession that, quote, there may be exceptions to this general rule. And these two uh, caveats never really make it into um, introductory writing classes. And instead, what comes down is this sort of um, commandment saying, thou shalt not interrupt the dream. Never mind that dreams uh, are themselves often shards of images and that our own memories are fragmented. And um, you know, perhaps the desire to impose narrative continuity is born out of uh, the biological fact that uh, we have this struggle to consolidate uh, a self that has no actual center. I would all argue that all narrative, including self-narrative, the, the story we tell of ourselves is fragmentary by nature. And it's the sense of coherence that's an illusion. Even in the simplest stories we tell, which are those based on memory, there are ellipses, misrepresentations, willful forgetting, and erasures. The sheer density of experience makes this editing necessary. Under the sway of Gardner's vivid and continuous dream, I nevertheless wanted to write the kind of seamless narratives um, that characterize so many of the novels that I enjoyed as a child, as a young adult, and as an adult, which I still enjoy. Uh, novels that are seamless, that you lose yourself in, you know, Trixie Belden and Judy Blume's fabulous books. Um, and I love them, even as I sense that their linear structure did not speak to the worlds and eddies in my own life. Um, as a daughter and granddaughter of immigrants whose stories uh, were painful and hilarious, um, but always discontinuous, um, lurching forwards and backwards, uh, sometimes in the same sentence between the past and the present. La Lucha Vida, um, which I encountered, um, this is a, 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 another Zoom meeting uh, uh, representation of some of my influences. 
So um, Dolce Vita is in there. I included two films uh, that have really influenced me and that I love and that everybody should see if you haven't already, now that we uh, have the time, uh, some of us. Uh, Dolce Vita, uh, I encountered an undergraduate film class actually at FIU, and it, it kind of changed my life. And I don't want to get bogged down in definitions because it could be that the uh, scenes that make up this fabulous movie are more properly called vignettes. Um, but the way that the formal way that the movie fragments each scene begins at nightfall, ends at dawn, uh, while tracing the story of Marcello's own dissolution uh, impacted me enormously and really primed me for this kind of um, uh, fragmented narrative uh, that, that I continue to respond to in both written and visual art. Uh, it was the same thing with 32 short films about Glenn Gould, which is there next to him. Uh, which is a, a film uh, of Glenn Gould's life, the pianist Glenn Gould's life told through 31 fragments, um, fictional reenactments, as well as real interviews with people who knew him. And I don't have time to talk about all the books, um, and some of them aren't even on here, but I, I want to mention briefly uh, La Vie Mal um by uh, George Perrick, who's trans translated into English as Life of User's Manual, because I think it's the book that has the most direct influence on this book. Uh, I read it uh, for the first time in about 2009, 2008, 2009, full of repetitions and digressions uh, that sometimes strain at the bare sense making and it all, it, it all traces the life of uh, people living in this Parisian apartment block. And so under the uh, sort of wonderful influence of this book, I began uh, to write the first version of this, uh, this new novel which was then called La Calle Baldini, and it became La Cavilla Baldini, and it morphed into the death of Lenin Garcia, and then it became Homes We Lost, and then it's in its present title, Castle of the Stranger. Um, and so in a process that's more akin, I think, to sculpture than anything else, I've been writing, deleting, rewriting, and molding this novel for the better part of a decade, and it gets smaller with each pass. Um, there's some books that aren't here uh, that I want to talk about briefly um, because the fragmentary form has a long pedigree in literature uh, going all the way back to the satiricon, if, if you want to go back that far. Um, but particularly in modern times in the literature of, of Central and Eastern Europe, where writers such as Daniela Hodrova of the Czech Republic and of course Olga Tokarczuk of Poland have made it a real singular style. In Prague, I See a City, that's the name of the book. I have it somewhere around here. Um, written shortly after the fall of communism in Eastern Europe, uh, Hodrova tells the story of the cities in a, a series of short fragments with titles such as A Shred, A Game, and Above the City. In a foreword to a 2005 translation by David Short, the scholar uh, Regenda Chitnis writes of Hodrova, quote, her fiction epitomizes the attempt in the early 1990s to free Czech literature from political interpretation and exploitation and to distinguish between those who try to insulate themselves from the chaotic uncertainty of existence through the imposition of a false order. My friend uh, Christina Garcia recently published a beautiful novel in this European tradition entitled Here in Berlin. Um, and in a series of independently titled monologues, we get a haunting portrait of Berlin um, told, and, and this was the words I used in the blurb that I gave her, through the shifting kaleidoscopic stories of its people. So um, as I get ready to uh, close, I want to return to this image from La Lucha Vita um, because part of the delight of that movie told in fragments is that it's shot through with ruins. Uh, the motif is captured from the start with this famous opening scene of Christ being airlifted to the Vatican um, and it, you know, as they fly over ancient ruins suspended in mid-decay and then later uh, over half-built new post-war apartment complexes suspended in mid-creation. And it's one of the, the aspects of ruins and also the fragmentary form for that matter that um, they, are, they, they can resemble, uh, if, if you suspend time, they, they can resemble the act of creation. And um, in this way, ruins off, offer a snapshot of process and, and embody the Latin fragmentum as something that has been separated from the whole so one uh, can't talk about fragments without talking about uh, Sappho. And uh, unlike the fragments that I've been talking about until now, these are fragments that were not originally written as fragments, but that have passed down to us as a kind of ruin that has acquired meaning in the way that all ruins acquire meaning. Um, 
in If Not Winter, first published in 2002, and Carson breaks with centuries of tradition to peel away the layers of kind of restorative paint that previous poets have applied to Sappho's fragments to present them in their sort of unadulterated ruined beauty. I'll close with um, fragment 168b, uh, moon has set in Pleiades, middle night, the hour goes by, alone I lie. I've always, this fragment's always moved me uh, so much. And, and, and part of the reason is that it, it recalls to me Robert Hass's uh, translation of Basho, uh, awake at night, the sound of the water jar cracking in the cold. It's a, a fragment that, I've, a, a, a haiku that I've always uh, loved so much. And I, I find it uh, reflected in a strange way in this much earlier work, obviously, um, and um, it, it's, it speaks to uh, this, this uh, fragmented sense of self when one is lonely, when, when um, one is lying awake uh, alone, as a lot of us are these days. So I'll end, I, I have a, a friend, a Facebook friend in New York, Leslie Pink, who sends me um, PowerPoint slides from uh, Andrew Cuomo. And I'm joking that one day I'm gonna put together a PowerPoint presentation that consists only of uh, Cuomo slides. But for now, I'm gonna, uh, I vow to include him in uh, one of his slides in everything that I present. And so uh, this is a recent one where he says, remember it is about we, not me. Um, and I really, I, I, I mean, I've loved all his slides and I, um, and I, for this one particularly speaks to what this novel represents to me, which is um, the fact that we have survived to now uh, by our interconnectedness. And when that fails, life fails uh, and we fail. And um, the only way to continue to survive is to recognize this very obvious point that we all are um, very connected and that we all need to care for one another. Um, and um, I'll end it at that. I know that um, really looking forward to hearing uh, Anna Lushinska's uh, presentation. So I'm gonna stop this now and hopefully uh, not everybody has fled. And uh, thank you all uh, for uh, listening and um, I, I find sometimes that readings are um, can be a struggle to get through and I, I, I realize that it takes a lot so I'm grateful uh, for all of you being here. Anna, we are grateful to you. Um, it's such a treat for our community um, to get to hear you read from a work in progress, especially those of us who have read your other books. Um, and to hear you talk about your influences, I know we're going to have a lot of questions about that. And no, no one has fled. We still have almost 100 people on this call right now. So. Um, everybody has stuck around. It is uh, now my pleasure to introduce uh, the respondent for this event, who is Professor Anna Lushinska, who is a scholar of comparative literature specializing in phenomenology, deconstruction, post-colonial and queer theory, 20th and 21st century US literature, Latinx literature, and African-American literature. She is also the chair of the Department of English at FIU, Anna Lushinska. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, I am, and also, of course, thanks to Ana Menendez for um, that lovely presentation, as well as your many years of creative gifts. Um, I'm really grateful to be here um, with both of you. And I'm also so grateful to you both for all of the energy and time that you took to put this together, this amazing presentation. So thank you both. Um, so I am Ana Lashinska. I am the chairperson of the Department of English, associate professor. Uh, I have been studying Ana Menendez's work uh, for 15 years. I have been studying, teaching, uh, presenting, researching uh, since 2004, roughly. Um, after that studying reading, I'm sure we all can understand why I have chosen to do so. It has been such a pleasure and um, it's been incredibly rewarding and fulfilling for me. Um, so, particularly in this time where we all need some story storytelling sustenance, um, I think uh, that reading was fabulous for us. Um, I can't think of anyone better to, to shepherd us through that, so thank you. Um, okay, so there's so many things to say about Castle of the Stranger. Um, it is beautiful. 
uh, what we just heard. I want to just talk a, a, about a few elements that um, most struck me uh, as I listened and um, thought about some of the, the central issues involved. So the first one um, I want to talk about, the first element that I think is really important is the sense of um, how important the place and people who occupy the roles of context and narrator in this text and as well as in others. For those of you who have not read In Cuba, I was a German Shepherd, um, you need to do that like now. Uh, it, it is so Miami and it so speaks to us and it's a joy to teach for those of you who may be thinking about doing that, whether in high school or university or wherever. So there's many reasons that I love teaching um, Ana Menendez's work and many more that I love teaching it at FIU in Miami. One element of her work that makes it so immediately compelling to our students here and to many of us is the deep and nuanced sense of place of Miami that Menendez presents. She provides for the reader a profound understanding of this or that street, this or that area of the city um, and, the, and the corresponding cultures that each one indicate. Moreover, it's crucial to highlight, I think, the importance of seeing, quote unquote, our lives, uh, Miami lives represented on the page. I teach US Latinx literature. Uh, most of my students are from South Florida. And yet somehow, um, very, very few students in my class uh, have ever read Latinx literature, um, which is kind of stunning. But until my class or some of um, those of some of my colleagues, most of our students who are nonetheless either immigrants or descended from immigrants from Latin America and the Caribbean have not encountered literature from um, people like them, so to speak. So in terms of places and voices, it's not only that our students know the landmarks and the areas and their cultural nuances um, that Menendez references, but the very fact of being represented in a literary work gives us, I think, an immediate sense of intimacy with the texts, um, which is new for, for many people. Um, that intimacy in turn leads to a profound sense of empowerment, which is um, just priceless and incredibly important. We almost literally know these places and these people. Simply the act of allowing these voices to tell their stories, to narrate from their perspective, maybe a perspective of exile, of immigration, sometimes poverty, a war, um, oppressions of so many kinds. It's so important for all of us to hear, to see, and to understand these many perspectives. Um, this empowering of multiple voices over one singular authoritarian voice is itself a crucial and impactful contribution to the culture uh, of ways and ways of seeing and knowing of our cities, for us of Miami, of our country, indeed now of our world, we can see a little bit more clearly. To have a voice to tell the story, to narrate is to create. And I think that's something that Ana Menendez's text access so beautifully um, and, and vividly. We, end, we all must have the right and the space to create. Um, so that is um, something that I, I, I think we can't not see when we read um, Ana Menendez's text and when we listen to the readings like the one um, that we just heard. The second thing I wanna know is the fact that um, yet again, Ana Menendez has crafted, crafted a beautiful illustration of the ways in which we are all connected and cannot possibly disentangle ourselves from one another. By we, I mean like Andrew Cuomo, I think, uh, who may mean just New Yorkers, but we like as in human beings, <laughs> that's, I, I mean all of us, humans. Uh, in Castle of the Stranger, Menendez vividly illustrates how we cannot meaningfully exist if we are radically separated from each other. Any more than a word devoid of context can signify anything at all. Indeed, a single word without attachments to worlds and other words, imagine a word all by itself in a void, literally means nothing. Just as a single being only unto itself would mean nothing, literally signify nothing. Both being and words need the others that surround it to make meaning. We see in Ana Menendez's novel, the inevitable overlapping of our lives 
this text is a sort of narrative performance of the fact that we and our stories from which we cannot be separated are inextricably connecting, always overlapping, creating something like webs of meaning and significance in our own and each other's lives. Similar to so much of um, what Anna Menendez has written in the past, this text is presented in related vignettes uh, that both and simultaneously add layers to a central event and narrative and reveal interlocking woven in stories of their own that are both themselves singular or unique, but simultaneously related. The key word here being again related um, to the central story. In this case, the life of the fabulously named Lenin Garcia, about whom many of the characters in the novel itself has something to say, uh, that name. So it's all, uh, so it's all about, this is the central sort of narrative, but all of the other narratives in some way relate to his story. So they all mean sort of at the same time or together, or they sort of constitute meaning together. In this sense, one could say the text is a collection of fragments, these many voices from so many places and perspectives each contributes something like a piece, which is itself woven together with other pieces to create our narrative. The fragment, a powerful antidote to totalizing and potentially tyrannical single meaning or absolute truth is important for Menendez's stories and deserves a word or two. So what's a fragment? What is the opposite of a fragment? This is one good way to get at something. The opposite of a fragment is a totality a whole, a circle, pushed a step further, completion, arrival, totality, as in oneness, as in the way many of us were taught to write, introduction, body, conclusion, wherein we have come full circle and arrived finally back at the beginning. These are figures we have valued and prioritized historically, culturally, philosophically in the West. Uh, think of popular cultural expressions like, you complete me. Uh, I speak about this one in class a lot. Uh, for those of you who are old like me, you'll remember Jerry Maguire and the famous line in the movie Jerry Maguire where he's romantically, he says, you complete me, or she says, you complete me. Um, so the idea is there to be fulfilled, literally filled, right? Um, in romantic love, you're, you're, you're completed. Uh, sometimes when referencing mental health and sometimes narrative, um, we see the desire for an admiration of feeling whole, right, rather than fractured or fragmented. Um, we could also go on for a long time. I won't belabor it and, and bore you all, but feminists have been talking for a very long time, over half a century at least, about how it is that women speak or women's voices tend to be not cohesive at worst and nonsensical at best, right? We just keep going off into different tangents and can't keep it whole and clear. So the last thing I want to know is briefly um, three distinct yet overlapping ways of thinking about um, or accessing what I call this anti-structure of the fragment. So writing, one way is the fragment as in writing or language or storytelling in the fragment, being in the fragment, and time in the fragment. So just as soon as we begin to discuss these scenes in the context of fragmentation, we find that they too cannot be separated, yet are distinct, right? Uh, stories, overlapping stories in some sense, not unlike the very characters of Castle of the Stranger, with each vignette invoking and adding to the others, but at the same time being unique and attached by nature, inseparable. Indeed, one of my favorite lines in the text speaks to the issue of mortal fragmentation, if we think about being and fragmentation. The fact that we are all born and die, we all humans, and what we do in the meantime, in between, is cling to something like connection, or as, at, as Miriam Nader calls it, love. She says, quote, birth and death are perched on a precipice, my dear one the years in between we cling to love. So it seems to me that right now, during this global pandemic, our interconnection and our dependence is laid out for us in sharp relief. It's really very, very difficult not to see it, <laughs> such as the really experience also of Castle of the Stranger. Nothing is or can be in isolation. 
Indeed, the text itself, both its form, again, the fragments, the vignettes, and the content, the life of Lenin Garcia, they show us the poignant and sometimes tragic results of this fundamental interconnection that we cannot avoid. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Lushensko, for your response. Um, we now have maybe 25 minutes for discussion and questions. And the question, we have so many different audiences involved in this event. We have high school students, we have uh, professors, undergraduate students, graduate students, people from the community. Uh, all questions are in balance. That's what I'm getting at. Feel free to ask your questions. The way that we're going to do this is to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you're on Zoom, if you're on the Zoom module, just look at the bottom of the screen. There, you'll see that it says uh, Q&A and maybe chat. Please don't use the chat function. We're going to use Q&A. You can type your questions. Cualquier pregunta que tengáis en español también, adelante. Comentarios en español, bienvenidos. Um, so I will read the questions out loud um, and send them to Ana Menendez. If you have questions for Ana Lushinska, the professor of English, um, feel free to pose those questions as well. So Ana and Ana, are we ready for questions? Yeah. Ana Menendez, you might need to unmute. Both of you maybe unmute your mics. And I'm going to just start looking. Uh, OK. So many people are just saying, um, on a beautiful drawings, reading stories, this is everything. That comes from Juan Arevalo here in Miami. Uh, our colleague Julian Drayson says, not a question, only a comment. Wonderful, a terrific multimedia reading, a real pleasure and perfect topic for our moment. Uh, Let's see, for Ana Menendez, Jennifer uh, Rivera says, the motif of loss is explicit in the narrative and every character that you have shared. Do you consider this an essential part of creating a character's identity? You mentioned the rat motif and said they have this endless loop of wandering. What is the inspiration for this metaphor? Since you are a former reporter, is the first story a mode of art reflecting life? Would you say the concept of home is also fragmented identity? So there's a bunch of questions there. Do you want me to, let me just reread the first one. Uh, the first piece, Anna, is the motif of loss is explicit in the narrative in every character that you've shared. Do you consider this loss an essential part of creating a character's identity? Um, yes, thank, thank you for the question. Um, it was very thoughtful and beautiful. Uh, absolutely, especially when when uh, organizing a book that's made of fragments. My my last book was also pretty. Uh, it was composed of um, pieces. Uh, Adios, happy homeland. And when I when I'm writing that way, I find that um, motif naturally emerges from the writing. Sometimes I'm not uh, setting out to capture a certain motif, but uh, it emerges from the writing. So one of the motifs that emerge from the writing of this is the sense of things could have been different, right? This is Borges' garden of forking paths. So that's one of the motifs. But certainly loss uh, was one that I very, um, was very much, I was very much conscious of as I was writing about because um, in one of the earlier versions of this, the disconnection between the tenants was acute and each one could only talk about their own loss. Um, so there's a, there's a ghost of that. There's a ghost of the fact that sometimes we close ourselves off in our stories without realizing how connected they are and how much we do share because we are stuck in the parameters and the specificity of our own stories. And, and so uh, in putting this book together, it was important for me, for every character to have this, this story of loss. As for the, the rat motif, that kind of emerged out of the writing. Um, I personally have a lot of rat stories. <laughs> Some of this, some of the uh, vignettes that uh, that the narrator talks about uh, really come, they're, they're fairly autobiographical, not all of them. Um, and, and in fact, most of them are invented or uh, elaborated. The, that particular one that I read uh, about the rats isn't, that actually did happen to me when I lived in India. And I, I write a longer piece about rats in general um, that came out in new letters uh, some time ago. So that, you know, that is actually a slightly reworked, um, you know, essayistic vignette. 
Anna, you sort of answered this part already, but um, Jennifer also asks, is, since you're a former reporter, is the first story of a mode of art reflecting life? The first story, the, the uh, oh, the, the yeah. Uber driver. Um, it was a, it, it was it was one of the stories that came very easily to me. So it, it's not art reflecting life in the sense that I um, I did work for a paper for 25 years or whatever she worked. I can't remember what it was. And I also didn't uh, I don't drive an Uber. Um, uh, I don't drive for Uber. And I'm also not bitter. Uh, I left <laughs> I left the paper in 2008, my last newspaper job uh, to to go to Cairo. So it was very much my choice. Um, but it's certainly reflective of, of uh, it's sort of an amalgamation of all the stories of very dear friends who have gone through um, what's a very tragic um, part of our, you know, story of, of journalism in our times. And, you know, people are under the impression that this pandemic is being flamed by the media to make money. And in fact, uh, most of newspapers are giving away the content and are closing and going bankrupt at alarming rates. And what people, a lot of people unfortunately don't realize is that really journalists are our last wall of protection against tyranny. Um, and the, you know, make mistakes and have biases, all of that is true, we're all human. But, you know, the loss of journalism as I knew it when I started in journalism in 1991 um, is a real tragedy uh, for our democracy. Um, what about home as fragmented identity? I want to ask you about this, but I also want to ask Anna Lushinska because I know she talks about and thinks about home as fragmented identity. So maybe both of you could respond to that piece. What would you say uh, about the concept of home as fragmented uh, an identity? I'll, I'll, I'll cede the floor to Anna and then I'll, I'll step in. Oh, no. <laughs> um... Oh, we've talked about this so much and I've, um, yes, I've written about this and we've talked about it. Um, I feel like we've talked about it if we haven't literally. Um, it seems to me, I guess the best way I would answer that is that home is also um, a series of narrations. Um, and that comes through very clearly in, in many of your texts. Um, I mean, many. Uh, Adios, Happy Homeland, um, Anne and Q, I was a German Shepherd, and this one, that um, it is inevitably narrated. It is inevitably narrated in time. We can't not, uh, we are remembering and it, therein interpreting. And that's where I was talking about creating, sort of to remember is to write, is to create. Um, and so home is no exception, right? So we are continually sort of reworking and re-understanding what that means to us. Um, and for those of us who are first generation or immigrants ourselves, like that it just complicates it because home is over there in a different time, um, in a different place. So there's this kind of rupture and um, maybe a little bit of a, of a sense of, of, of loss or longing um, that accompanies it at least often. So that's what I would say. Yeah, no, it, it's a beautiful way to put it. And I, I don't know that I have much to add. I Just as you were talking, I was thinking of uh, Edward Said's um, well-known quote, which I'm going to utterly mangle now because I don't have it in front of me, but where he says to speak of exile as um, something positive that create that's creative and, and gives us humanism is to ignore its mutilations. And um, and I think that that quote very much speaks to that idea that you know the mutilation is the the shattering um, of, of of a concept of place and a concept of safety, um, and that for for many people is something that is never recovered, is never made whole again. Yeah. On a, our colleague. Uh, Paula Gillespie asks, what made you decide on Miami as the setting for this novel? Could you just talk a little bit about your um, thinking on Miami, or your process there? Hi, Paula. I hope this finds you well uh, and safe. I miss you. Um, yeah, why Miami? I, I asked myself the same question. I've been running away from the place for so long. <laughs> um, it, I, I, I wrote it, I started writing it when I was very far from Miami, which happens uh, a lot. Uh, I write about a place when I'm gone from it. And I was living in Amsterdam uh, when I first started the book. And uh, I don't know, maybe it was a, a species of homesickness uh, that, that led me to Miami and to 
a, a specific type of South Beach and South Beach living, because I, I did live in an apartment in South Beach, not unlike this one, um, with a lot of characters and a lot of stories. So I think um, it's a place that I know best. And I, I find that writing is so hard that, at least for me, that I don't need to make it harder by setting it in a place where, that I don't know with people that I don't really know. Um, so it's a kind of a short, a shortcut. Thank you. Um, Anna Lushinska, we have a question from a high school student, Elizabeth Mikhail, who says, I was curious as to how a high school student can apply for the Latinx literature course at FIU over the summer, as I'm interested in taking the course over break. So maybe you'll talk about um, matriculating or not, but maybe also talk to the students about Latinx literature and what goes on in that course. Sure. Um, thank you for that wonderful, inspiring, happy question. Um, I'm so I, I'm thrilled to hear of the of that interest, and I I'm not surprised. Um, so we have um, some. I I am now chair, so I'm teaching a lot less. Um, but we do. I have some amazing colleagues, Dr. Michael Grafals, um, and Dr. Annie Castro. Both teach um, Latinx literature. Um, so you can look for those. I'm not sure if they're teaching this summer, um, but they might be. Actually, they both are. So you should l look into both of them, Dr. Annie Castro and Dr. Michael Grafals. Um, they both do Caribbean and Latin American and, and some other, um, Michael does some African as well. At any rate, um, what goes on? So we, do, we inevitably, um, you do, we do a bunch of um, Chicano, Chicanex, um, as I, I was like to say, um, the U.S. was at one time Mexico, <laughs> a good portion of it. So there's a lot to cover there. Um, and then we do like I teach. I teach Ana Menendez in every single class that I teach, pretty much. <laughs> anytime I do literary theory, anytime I do um, obviously a Latinx literature class, um, women literature, I, I teach Ana Menendez. So I, I, and I know my colleagues tend to spend a good amount of time on Caribbean, um, whether it's um, some Cuban, Dominican, um, Haitian as well, so um, Puerto Rican. I um, it, the class depending on what your specific what the specific class is. There's just surveys, just like you get like your survey in um, in quote unquote American or British literature. You here we do Latinx, so that's writ literature written by um, people who are either immigrants or descendants or, or first gen um, in the U.S. So written often in Spanish and English. Um, there's so many brilliant texts um, out there that 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 should we all need to read, um, including a couple that um, Ana Menendez read, including all of her work, plus Christina Garcia, also Cuban, Juno Diaz. Um, there, there's some just um, a, amazing forces in the literary world that are Latinx. Um, so if you would like to take that those classes, again, look for Dr. Annie Castro, Dr. Grafals. I teach it probably now like once a year. Um, and it, and um, yeah, you could, you, you certainly, you could, I, I would encourage you to, um, to take that class as a high school student. Thank you. And thank you, Elizabeth, for asking that question. We hope you come to study with us and major in English. <laughs> um, uh, Ana Menendez, there's a follow-up question to Paula Gillespie's question from Juan here in Miami, who says, um, how was the more specific setting of South Beach chosen? For your newest novel and will all of south florida readers be able to relate as well to the setting compared to a more abstract setting and i'm wondering if you could just also talk about um uh, relatability and who who do you imagine your audience as being um do you imagine a south florida audience or miami audience when you write or do you imagine an audience at all hmm. yeah good question um the south beach mostly for me again to what I, I spoke about earlier, it's a place that I lived and I and I knew, um, even if I don't quite understand, I don't think I've ever quite understood any place that I've lived in. Um, but at least I, I felt that I had a, a foothold in it. Um, and it's also unique, almost unique among places in South Florida in its, in its urban setting, right? I mean, it's, it's a very urban or as urban as we get in South Florida where you can, you know, live without a car, where people live very close in close proximity to one another, and where there are still um, less and less every year, but but still 
a, a mix of generations and ethnicities and uh, orientations and philosophies, and somehow they live together. It's a sort of a, a, a mini uh, New York City in, in that sense. Um, very different, of course, but and so for that reason, I, I did want to make it an urban setting and I did want people who live together on top of each other, literally, um, in a way that you don't in the suburbs, for instance, or even in a house, right? There's something about sharing a building. And I, as I think I mentioned a little bit earlier, the first inspiration for this was um, a Life for User's Manual. Um, and it you know takes place in a very different book, um, but it, it does look at the inhabitants of a apartment complex. It's a it's quite an old form to, to do this, um, to gather people where they can't really leave and their neighbors and and tell their stories. So so that was it. As as far as audience, um, I don't know if I had a specific audience in mind when I set to write this. Um, it was more of a, a exploration of different modes of loss and 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 misconnections and, and disconnections and connections and 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 one story kind of grew out of the other. In, in this sense, it was very much like Adios Happy Homeland in that I didn't have a master plan. Um, and maybe that's the problem <laughs> to not have the master plan. But I find it very hard to have a master plan. Um, when I sit down to write, because it takes all the joy out of it for me. Um, for me, writing is very much an, ex an, ex an exploration. Uh, and I, and I want to be delighted by that exploration, not paint by numbers. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's kind of a long-winded way of, of answering your question, and maybe I haven't. But I, I really didn't have a um, specific audience in mind other than just you know, people living today, I guess, and and, um, and and perhaps people who have lost, have lost homes. As I said, one of the original titles for this book was Homes We Lost, and it opens with a long list of cities um, with no explanation, just mm -hmm. cities that people have fled. Um, and I want to add, uh, just to, to refer back to what Anna just said, just how uh, touched and, and thrilled I am that so much of, uh, of FI, the, the support from FIU and, and so many fantastic uh, scholars like Dr. Lushinska, like Dr. Grafals and, 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 and Carter, um, their commitment to the literature of this place is, is just so important uh, to all of us, um, especially to writers who are working here. And who, you know, weren't always included in in English uh, curriculum. And then, of course, the students, the students that I've met visiting uh, Dr. Lushinsky's classes and Dr. Grafal's classes. I think I've been to Dr. Grafal's classes every year um, for, you know, forever. And it, I always come up, back so energized from the students, and for the students to be able to enter a dialogue with books is just such a privilege. Mm -hmm. Um, Anna, there's a quick question from Susan Tenney who asks, when do you anticipate your book's publication? I think she's referring to Castle of the Stranger. Everybody wants to know. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for everybody's kind words. Um, and uh, and it, it gives me hope because I, 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 I still have work to do. Um, and as happens with books that are not necessarily page turners, I think I can call, I can say that. <laughs> safely um they they struggle to find an audience and to find a publisher who's interested so any publishers out there who are interested we're we're shopping it and i still do need to do some work on it um but you know i because of my journalism training i think i work very well with editors and i find that i'm not able to finish a book until somebody else is reading it and helping me tease out what it is that I'm trying to say. To me, it's very much a collaborative. Mm -hmm. uh, I collaborate uh, with editors in a way that maybe is not usual for, for a lot of writers. But again, this comes from journalism where you were writing so quickly on the fly and had to really trust uh, the people you work with to help make it better um, and, and have the humility to say, yes, this, this is not good enough. Uh, um, our 
event is scheduled to end right now at 2.15 Eastern time. However, we still have over 20 comments and questions and I'm wondering if you would be able to stick around for maybe 10 or 15 more minutes. We also yes. still have a lot of people on the call. Yes, so yes, I would love to. Let's take a few more. There's a really beautiful question from our colleague in modern languages, Andrea Fanta, who says, listening to you reading made me feel that the world in those stories is so far away from our current state of social separation yet so close in our recent past, it made me wonder, how do you feel about reading those passages now? Yeah, that is a really great question because I'm, I'm reading them and I'm thinking, especially, you know, the, the traffic, um, you know, the, the Uber driver complaining about the traffic, it's completely obsolete. <laughs> um, it's astonishing now. Um, you look at these ribbons of roadways and think, you know, what, what were we thinking? Um, so it is a weird, it, it's, you know, time has collapsed and accordioned and expanded and everything else, and we have no sense of where we are. Um, and, and that kind of life seems so far away. I mean, I, I see photos uh, on Facebook of me hugging uh, my friends after readings and things and just get so nostalgic. And then I think, well, that was just six months ago, or <laughs> that was just a couple of, you know, years ago. So the world has changed so much. Um, and, um, you know, uh, this book doesn't directly speak to that. Although when I was reading Miriam's sections again, that sense, of course, very different of being under siege, but that sense of, of uh, having to, to survive a, a change in, a, in, in such a uh, changed circumstance, again, very different, um, I think captures the fact that um, we, as I said, we need one another uh, to survive. And if we don't, um, we, we lose, we lose ourselves, we lose our own stories. So. Anna, there's a question from Ari Sheris in Texas who's asking about the Golden Notebook. I'm not sure if you've read that. Yeah, okay, so Doris Lessing. Another great influence, Doris Lessing, yeah. So Ari asks, uh, Doris Lessing's novel, The Golden Notebook, is rich in its exploration of fragmentation. Lessing writes about the characters in her novel, quote, they have also reflected each other, been aspects of each other, given birth to each other's thoughts and behavior, are each other, form wholes. That's Doris Lessing, The Golden Notebook, 1971, from the introduction. Does this chime or intersect with the ways you might reframe fragmentation or your characters? If so, or if not, could you please elaborate? Oh. Well, that's just a fabulous question. And, you know, I haven't read that book in um, oh, 25 years or more. Um, so thank you, because I'm going to I'm going to dip back into it. Um, and it may may help me solve some of my problems, uh, as the greats always end up doing. Um, I, you know, I, I can't hope to equal it, but it, it can offer great inspiration. Um, I remember when I read it. And again, I was I was in my early to mid 20s when I read it. And I just being, um, it was one of those books uh, that that sort of changed my whole idea of what was possible in literature. I think all of us writers have a book like that. I mean, I have several. Um, and that was definitely one of them. So thank you for the reminder. <laughs> um, yes, I think absolutely the, the characters give birth to each other and they uh, their stories um, echo one another. And the stories also provide mo motifs, you know, back to this, this idea of motifs. It's one of, one of the stories I didn't read was uh, about a woman, Susan Clark, uh, and her daughter who, who talks about the multiverse, you know, young daughter, teenager, she's obsessed with the multiverse and the idea that different things can, you know, their time has joints. Um, and that became, um, um, an important part of some of the other stories, and it became part of this little vignette that I read on on Lenin Garcia survives his first death. He doesn't realize there's a, in an earlier vignette. Susan Clark says we don't, you know, we we don't realize. Everybody says, oh, if he would have left the house 20 minutes earlier, he wouldn't have been killed. But nobody realizes, well, you left the house 20 minutes earlier and were not killed. Um, and nobody knows that. And what happens if we would know that? You know, how would that change? Um, so that observation by that one character led to this particular vignette. So they, you know, they did give literal birth to, to each other in, in that way. Yeah. Thank you for that. 
There's a question from a student I take to be an undergraduate student, maybe at FIU, Gabby Dowell, who says, I am doing my final work on the death of Lenin Garcia that appears in Let's Hear Their Voices, Cuban American Writers of the Second Generation. So we're going to talk about that in a minute. But um, Gabby asks, throughout the excerpt, the narrator laments on the lack of community and interaction. But as soon as Liliana tries to interact with her, the narrator is almost speechless, giving two word answers. What is the motive behind the apprehension of the narrator? If you don't mind taking a question on that. So the question is um, the inarticulateness of the narrator in, in the face of uh, Liliana, is that right? While she's talking, just how she answers with, yeah. Yes, um, there, there's, no, um, there's no give and take. And it emerged as one of one of the things that uh, happens frequently in these. I mean, part of it is because they're monologues and they're supposed to be monologues, but there is a disconnection. There's an inability to uh, connect in a lot of in a lot of these uh, pieces. Um, and I guess I'm still trying to figure out what that means. So a related question, I think, about um, connecting and uh, fragmentation comes from Francisco Lopez, who has a question for both of you. Uh, uh, I love the emphasis on fragments, and I'm wondering if either both of y'all can speak to the fragment, to the way fragments carry some trace or contour of the so-called original whole. How, <laughs> uh, yes. How does our attention to fragments as a kind of reading practice speak to the concern of place, space, home? For Ana Menendez specifically, how does this play out as a writing practice for you? Um, I, I let Anna speak to the first part of that, uh, if, you, if you like. Um, yeah, let's do that. Hi, Francisco. Um, um, Philip, could you repeat yes. that? Yes. I'm wondering if either of both of you can speak to the, to the way fragments carry some trace or contour of the so-called original whole. How does our attention to fragments as a kind of reading practice speak to the concern of place, space, and home? Ooh, that's a big one. Um, okay, so I would first say um, the, 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 the first part of the question presupposes a whole um, that I'm not sure that I would necessarily do. Um, I think of the whole or a totality as, a, as, a, as an idea. Um, and, and not necessarily a baseline idea, one from which we have to begin. Um, um, I, I think of experience and thinking and writing and being and all of that. I, I tend to think of it more in fragmented terms. Um, and I think similar to dreams, when you dream, you know, you wake up and you sort of put it together, but dreams are often just kind of fragments that we, that we, we make into a whole. Um, and I'm not sure that it's always in fact, I'm sure it's not always beneficial to start from the point of departure of whole. There may be times in which it is, but um, there may be times in which it isn't. Um, as far as the trace and the fragment, um, I, 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 I'm not sure which element of the trace you're talking about, if you're talking about like Levinasian trace or like a, what kind of philosophical trace, but um, I, think of, I think of fragment as absolutely related to trace. Um, insofar as it's both pre both present and absent in some way, right? L like a literal trace or like an echo, like something like that. So it, it sort of invokes, was something I was kind of getting at, it invokes um, a, a, a meaning that it, that it cannot quite arrive at. <laughs> um, that would be like, that would be the trace and that would also be the fragment, that would also be language and that would also be being for me. Um, <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so all related, all, um, uh, um, super important. So I, I think I addressed the two. The first is the, um, the the point of departure of the whole, like echoing a whole that I, I don't start there is, would be one. And I think there's many thinkers who do not start there. You could start there, but since I don't, I can't really answer it in those terms. And second would be that yes, fragment and trace um, completely um, 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 related to me. And, and actually the element of the trace of the fragment is to me um, probably one of the most important um, because I, for me, that's the place from which ethics would arrive. I don't think I have much to add to that very um, uh, astute and smart uh, answer, other than to say that, uh, you know, as a writer working in fragments, um, I think a lot of us are 
don't start with a hole. We, um, con we, we seek to um, evoke, I think is, is part of what Anna was alluding to, evoke the whole through the fragments, uh, but not because we have a whole in mind, um, but because the fragments themselves um, suggest uh, a meaning that's greater than, than what they individually um, can aim for. And in terms of holding a trace, when you were asking the question, I was thinking of fractals um, mm. and how you know they they can they can suggest um, they can suggest a, a larger dimension within their uh, small parameter of their own dimension. And I, I think ideally um, that's one of the effects that I'm striving for. Uh, it, I fall fall short of it often again and again, but it is one of the things that I aspire to is to, to capture um, whatever it is that those fragments are aiming for. Um, that is maybe not a whole, but that is, um, uh, it sort of suggests uh, a, a story that is bigger. Mm -hmm. I wanted to read a comment from our friend, colleague and esteemed poet Richard Blanco, who says, I'm teaching Latinx South Florida voices in fall 2020. Loving this session, Richard Blanco. Thank you, Richard. Richard. <laughs> okay, a quick follow-up from Paula, who asks, as you revise your book, do you imagine the experience of uh, the sequester will influence any element of it? Mm. Yeah, um, that's a really great question. It would be a completely different book, um, which, I think would be fun to write. Um, I, I think I would need more distance uh, from it. Uh, I am, for the first time in my life, keeping a journal um, uh, every day, just about feelings uh, of, of frustration or joy or whatever they happen to be. Um, I'm extremely privileged uh, in, in my position uh, to do so. Um, but I am keeping a, a notebook. And I don't know, I think it would be interesting to do because you know, in a building, everybody would be sequestered together. Um, and, and, and there's a lot that could happen there. Again, it would be a completely different book uh, that, you know, I've been known to rip up and start over again. And it has been 10 years. <laughs> so, um, so we'll see, Paula, I'll, I'll keep you posted. I think the fact that there's still so many people on this call and that there's almost 20 questions and comments indicates that People are ready for the book now. <laughs> From your lips. <laughs> we have reached our time limit. It's 2.30. So, uh, Professor, Professor Lushinska, thank you so much for participating. And Ana Menendez, thank you so much for this amazing time with Chue and with our FIU community and South Florida community. Thank you, Philip and Anna and everybody who tuned in. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Thanks. And please visit us online at humanities.fiu.edu, where we'll post this video and we post uh, videos of all of our events. We have amazing content online, so see you there. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.